welcome to Managing Love Intelligently. My name is Jason. And my name is Steve. And Steve is a licensed marriage and family therapist with over 30 years experience. And as of yesterday, I'm a 40-year-old man. Whoa, congratulations. So, Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've got a big birthday coming up pretty soon. And I'm I'm looking at it as a, an accomplishment because uh, the men in my family... They don't generally live that long, so yeah. it's pretty cool. And yours is in April, right? It is. And you'll be the big seven zero. Yes, and I like that. That nice round number feels really good. Yeah, we're exactly thirty years apart. Close or enough. not close enough. I mean, <laughs> almost, almost exactly. <laughs> um, so that's kind of that's cool. Well, I'm forty, and he'll be seventy. Yes, and, and we'll be of, giving out. Stay tuned because we'll be giving out our social security numbers and our birth dates later on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, how this works is I present a topic to Steve, which I have planned ahead of time, and Steve has no idea about, and we talk about it for an hour or so. And today's topic is what's your magic sex number? So think about that for a second. And before we kick off the conversation, if you have a question for Steve, visit stevening.com and fill out the contact form. At the end of each episode, Steve will answer a listener question. So stay tuned for that. So I'm just going to give a little background to the listeners. So back in 2018, Steve gave a TEDx talk at the University of Nevada, Nevada titled, What's Your Magic Sex Number? And if you're interested in watching that talk, you can visit stevening.com and scroll down to the bottom right corner of the homepage and click on the appropriate link. Um, or you could just go to my YouTube channel and by entering Stephen Ng on the YouTube search bar and it'll pop right up. Yep. It's another way. There's all a bunch of ways to find this. We're not like Mandalorians. This, this is not the way. We have lots of ways. Lots of ways. <laughs> So again, so this concept, so some people maybe have seen that video who are listening to this, and this may be a brand new topic to somebody. So um, in this podcast, we're going to kind of get like do a deep dive into it because the TEDx talk is probably 12, 13 minutes, something Only like that, 10, 10 minutes. Yeah. So, so we're going to get do like, this is going to be like the director's extended cut. Yeah. Yeah. The commentary <laughs> version. <laughs> so to start, uh, can you kind of explain what? is the magic sex number. Sure. I'd be glad to. And uh, it's funny that because I don't know what you're going to bring up. I never do know what mm -hmm. you're going to bring up. But I <laughs> was thinking about this topic this last week a lot because I had so many clients who came into my office, many of them for the first time, but a number uh, who, had I, who had been in my office for some time. And I, the, the topic of, well, what was your sex life like leading up to the troubles that you had, whether it was a divorce or it was a, uh, a sex crime or it was, a, you know, getting referred to sexual harassment training classes because he behaved badly at work or something. And, and invariably, and I mean like a hundred percent of the time, it was so, so freaking weird because I'd ask that. So how often had you two been having sex leading up to you know, this problem. And I would hear stories like, well, you know, for seven years, we'd had the, the last seven years of our marriage, we'd only had sex maybe once a month at the most. And then we, we set a six month record one time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was like no sex for six months. I know it sounds That's crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, it just for a married couple, it's yeah. like, yeah, I get married to practice celibacy. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. So it was so <laughs> strange. And, and I, and I asked them, would you ever put up with that again? Would you ever last that long again? And of course, everybody has learned a lesson like, no, of course not. I would never go through that again. I don't care who I married or how much I loved her or anything else because it's simply unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to both men and women talking about this. And there was so much unhappiness and there's such an easy fix. So let me tell you what the... The definition of the word, like you asked, what is the magic sex number? Well, just as in nature, you have an ideal number of hours of sleep that you typically require in order to greet the next day refreshed, or a typical number of calories that adequately fuels you for the day's activities, but not too much and not too little. There's, there's also, and it shouldn't be too surprising, an ideal number of sexual encounters as an adult that we 
would require just to feel our normal selves where we're not walking around uh, <laughs> looking <laughs> intently at every possible sexual opportunity we can or where we're so put off by the sexual demands that are put on us because we're just having sex too much. So ideally, if and this is the question I'd like the listener to pose to themselves, ideally, if you were in the perfect relationship, perfect in every way, and your partner loved you as much as you loved your partner, and sex was just perfect, you're having the perfect amount of sex, what would that number be roughly per week? And typically I get answers like, I mean, people don't dare to dream, right? Because they, <laughs> they'll say, well, I could get by on, you know, twice a week. Twice a week would be awesome, man. I would love twice a week or three times a week would be great. And so they're going at like the bare minimum. They're, they're always going, looking yeah. at the um, MDR, the minimum daily requirement. Okay. And instead of the idealized number, mm -hmm. and when you think about a, uh, a, vo a volitional elective procedure, like a nose job or a wedding, why would you get married without asking that question? But invariably, almost everybody I've talked to never had any conversation about this, this very particularly important idea mm -hmm. before they got married to somebody or got in an otherwise committed sexual okay. relationship. And, and there are any number of problems when later on that unfold when she finds out he prefers to have sex, you know, four times a week and she, her ideal would be four times a month. Mm -hmm. And so there's an inherent conflict. And the, the sad thing about this is that there's no right or wrong answer. It's not like eight hours is the only possible number of hours of sleep one could get and feel right or righteous about. And it's the same way with calories and the same way with the number of sexual encounters. The problem, though, that's different about sexual encounters versus calories and hours of sleep is in a monogamous committed relationship, I'm restrained by my marriage vows to get all of my sexual needs met through this one partner. But this one partner carries an inner conflict, and that conflict is either um, you know, put in a number like if X is the number of times I would like to have sex in a week and her number is X divided by four, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or her number is four times X. Yeah. Either way, uh, I'm really going to be in a lot of trouble. That's what I mean by magic sex mm -hmm. number. And everyone could have like the numbers throughout your, like how do the, the numbers, I'll get that first. So the numbers can range and everything is a normal range. Like you always say, like I've heard sure, you say, like sure. there's no one right way. So it's like people shouldn't feel bad about if they're like, well, I'm only a once a, or three times a month kind of person. It's like you should kind of own that and be proud of it and just. I don't know about being proud of well, it, <laughs> <laughs> but so certainly owning it. Like, you know, if you only needed three hours of sleep to feel uh -huh. tip top, Good for you. I mean, that's fantastic. But, yeah. you know, if you need nine hours, there's no reason to be hanging your head in shame like you're some sort of sluggard. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, just can't keep up with the three hour a night kind of person. So whatever it is, it, it simply is what your body requires. Your biology is most comfortable in that zone. And typically when people are getting their sexual needs met, they are um, not thinking about sex the rest of the day. Yeah. So, or, so whatever it is, um, is the right number. Typically when I'm working with a group, we'll go through the group and everybody will volunteer their numbers and they'll range from once a week to, uh, one half times per week. Cause once every two weeks mm -hmm. to maybe every day or even two or three times a day. And then I'll look at the group and I'll say, so which one of us is normal? And it just feels so right. The entire group always says at that point, well, we all are. Mm -hmm. And that's the right answer. Yeah. We're all normal. So there's no need to delve into the psychology of the poor man or woman who only wants sex one uh, fourth as often as you do, or the person who 
want sex four times as much as you do. They're not, they're not diagnosable at that point. They, they, we don't need to get, call in a mental health professional because they're a sex addict or they've been sexually abused and they're obviously repressed. They just are who they are. Yeah. And then to be asking yourself or prior to marriage, hopefully, well, is that going to work for me? Mm -hmm. Because there is no changing it. Now, I've had a lot of couples and individuals pose the question, but what about compromise? Can't we just compromise? Yeah. So if your number is six times a week and her number is twice a week, so you could compromise on four and then you'd always be feeling starved for sex and she'd always be feeling pressured. And that way everybody can be equally miserable. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that's not, that's not really a good number. I mean, to be with somebody whose ideal number is one third your number. I don't, I don't think that's particularly What if helpful. it's like, um, I'm six times a week and she's five times a week. Yeah. Then that's, we're in the ballpark. Then you're in the ballpark of compromise. So well, there's like give or yeah. take a day or well, usually in that case, I'll look at a couple and I'll say to him, would you be uh, comfortable if it turned out on a given week, it was only five times. Mm -hmm. And most guys who are saying six would say, yeah, sure. And if I said to her, but if once in a while on the weekend, mm -hmm. he wanted to hit it twice yeah. uh, and get up to six, <laughs> uh, would that be an unbearable burden or uncomfortable for you? And, and most women say no, because it's close enough. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's like if you need eight hours of sleep, but you only got seven hours and 30 minutes, most of us can make do. Got it. If you overslept to eight and a half hours, most of us, again, are going to be okay with that. Got it. So... So then how did you come up with this idea even? Is this something that you came up with from your own personal life or is this something that you learned from your clients or like how and when did this idea come to you? Because well, no one else has this idea. I don't think that they're saying this. This wonderful guy from, Unless there is. from, <laughs> from uh, the, the TED Talks people, he came to me and he talked to me about it. And, uh, about I, sex? Yeah. And he wanted to know if there was some topic that I would be willing mm -hmm. to share. And I shared a number of topics with him that I thought were very important. And he looked at me and it was one of those great moments in your life where somebody looks at you and says something truthful. And it's that you hear God going, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and it, he, I, I'd share idea after idea and he would say, yeah, that's not an idea worth sharing. Like where they that's their motto, right? Ideas okay. worth sharing, mm -hmm. and and I go with another one. Yeah, that's not an idea worth sharing. And then I sh I shared this one about sexual compatibility, and he perked up like like he'd heard the voice of the Lord, and it was like, yeah, that's a really great idea worth sharing. Mm -hmm. And so the talk went over well, and uh, it was pretty popular, and I, I still refer clients to it when they're thinking about it. But it's challenging, again, because if you're already invested in a marriage and then Stephen Ng comes along with the magic sex number talk in 10 minutes, are you really going to be able to adapt and change your thinking in 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Well, most people, most of us can't do that. Yeah. So it's an idea that I, <laughs> preferably we'd all be hearing about it many months or years before we met the right person and or the person we think is right for us so this is more like you want to know this before you're like during your intentional interview phase when you're talking to candidates that you'd like to marry and have like a long-term relationship with. yes yes and then um and then people say but what if you've already fallen in love or what if you're in love with this person and i I have to remind them that love is wonderful, certainly, and it's an essential part of any successful relationship, but it's not uh, sufficient for every um, successful relationship. So that's so, love isn't efficient for every- Sufficient. Sufficient. Love yeah. isn't sufficient. So if philosophy, in philosophy, we use the phrase, it's a necessary but insufficient condition. Mm. So love is necessary, but it's insufficient uh, for a successful relationship to unfold. And I think sexual compatibility is right in there too. It's necessary, but it's, uh, insufficient in and of itself, because what if, uh, I'm with somebody whose magic sex number is the same as mine, but they're disrespectful and abusive emotionally, uh, that's not going to work. Yeah. So it's, you know, I think this thing about love that we keep talking about, it's not so 
It's complicated, but it's not so complicated that human beings can't understand it. It's, it's, it's just there are a few moving parts to it. The good news is most of us have no trouble falling in love. Now, I know there's about a third of the population that at any given moment is so mentally ill, they cannot fall in love. Mm. And, and I'm sorry to say that's true, but it is. But for the rest of us, the falling in love part is like falling off of a log. It's so easy. It's effortless. And we, we often conflate that with compatibility. Mm. Oh, but we're in love. So, of course, it'll, we'll get along swimmingly. When in fact, those are two different things. Yeah. And I love too, I feel like some people, when they do have that or they say it, it's like, it means like, this is love. This is real. Like, this is, I don't know. They just, it it's seems magical. like, it, yeah, it seems like it takes on a magical sense to where it blinds them to even seeing the problems that are there, if there are any. I try to coach my clients into understanding that of any given relationship working out, the odds are very slim. So especially for the loving people listening to this who um, may have fallen in love for the first time back in first grade, or they may have had numerous crushes, which is a young person's version of falling in love. Um, there's also, you know, the people who fall madly deeply as young people like Romeo and Juliet or a lot of the rest of us when we were in high school and really thinking seriously, oh, this is it. We're going to be together forever. And then as time goes by, there are many uh, times where we fall in love. And I remember asking uh, one woman, uh, well, have you ever fallen in love before? And this was, I was in my late 30s and she was in her young 30s. And she said, well, never like this. Mm. And But you had a thing that you had a... <laughs> You, all, you were making all the women were loving you, it sounded like. Yeah, well, no. I, women found me quite resistible by the thousands but I, and still do. But I think holding it loosely, um, holding a relationship somewhat loosely until all the data is in. Mm. And so, yeah, I want to find out, does she know how to confront me when necessary? Yeah. I'd love to know if we can solve problems non-abusively and, and resolve conflicts without, you know, fighting unfairly. I'd love to know if we have enough compatibility to sustain a relationship over time. Not so much compatibility or common ground that you could bury us in it, mm -hmm. but enough to at least have interesting conversations or some shared mutual interests. And it goes on and on. Some of the old saws or so, some of the old sacred cows I, I've learned to throw out. I don't think in terms of intimacy, and certainly not spiritual intimacy, we have to have identicality of religion. Uh, I don't think Mormons have to be limited to marrying Mormons or Catholics limited to marrying Catholics. I think that's the limit on that is how much tolerance does one carry in one's heart. Mm. And if one is loving and tolerant and understanding, I think you can pretty much disregard religious orientation. Yeah. So the, I, I want to go back a little bit too. So the TEDx guy comes to you, you run through the topics. He's like, no, 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 no. But then yes on this one. But how did you come up before that with the concept of the actual, like, was it something in your own life with your last, your first marriage where you were like, I, there, I have an incompatibility thing here where I want sex more, or she wants sex less, or was it something that you noticed in yourself and then you started noticing in your clients, or is it something that your clients were talking to you about so much that they... I suppose of, I must have noticed it somewhat in my own experience, but I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit thick. <laughs> and so I have to have truths beaten over my head repeatedly before I start seeing them. And I, I suspect there are a few other uh, people like me listening to this, that it's it's not enough just to hear truth one time. So for me, um, I just noticed that there were so many unhappily married people who would come in with this complaint. And, you know, funny thing is, a lot of times they wouldn't come in with that complaint because they would be so shy. I think about talking about sexuality. They would want to talk about, well, I just don't feel loved, or we don't seem to be getting along, or we have a communication problem. Hmm. And maybe all of those things were true, but at some point I would bring up, and so how are you doing in your love life, your sex life? And they would say, you know, something like what we've been talking about. 
and and it occurred to me that wow that's a kind of a big discrepancy in the preferred number of sexual encounters per week something that most of us have no real control over right uh, whether we like to have sex once a week or seven times a week and it because it just whatever your number is feels perfectly natural to you just like your appetite for calories or mm -hmm. your appetite for sleep so um, I would talk about it with my clients. They'd bring up compromising or somebody would roll their eyes or wrinkle their nose or say, ew, you know, I mean, it was just, um, it, it would, the issue would devolve into a moral diagnosis. Well, he's a sex addict or she is uh, frigid or he, that's all he ever thinks about is sex. Mm -hmm. And none of this stuff is really true. For most people, the vast majority of people are not um, qualified to be called sex addicts or frigid. And I think both of those terms are absolutely meaningless anyway. So when we when we start getting into it, it there, there is a number that everybody likes. It's just, unfortunately, we don't all like the same number. Yeah. So then you noticed the pattern then throughout all your clients. And then you had an aha moment where you're like, I should start talking about this more mm -hmm. proactively, bringing it up, bringing it up in mar premarital counseling, bringing it up with couples who are thinking about maybe someday moving in, you know, I mean, just whatever stage of the relationship is, if you're thinking about moving in, if you're thinking about getting into a committed relationship, it is a very reasonable thing to have a conversation about sexual appetites. And so many people are gun shy about that because I don't want her to think I'm all about sex and that's all I ever think of. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, how <laughs> do you recommend, like, how does this come up in the dating phase? And like, is it supposed to come up like in the first date, second date, third date? Like, is there a specific time for that or is it something? Hi, my name's Steve. How, long, how often do you like to have sex? Yeah. <laughs> no, not, not probably the well, first not. date, but maybe, you know, I think... I think it could come up just about any time after we two start talking about, so do you ever think you're going to be in a committed relationship or what would you like your future relationship to look like? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my clients, I think I mentioned him last, uh, in one of our last podcasts, I asked him, uh, or he was telling uh, us in group that he was dating a, a woman he really liked. He asked her, well, what would you like to get out of? What are you looking for in a relationship? And she was stunned and she she answered him back with three comments. The first was, gee, I don't know. Boy, that's a weird question. <laughs> After some minutes of, you know, like yeah. 30 seconds of silence, thinking about it. And then it was, why do you always ask such weird questions? <laughs> and <laughs> he said he was just done. He was out. That was the last date they had because... It was so disappointing to think that there was somebody so lacking in self-awareness, they wouldn't want to begin building a relationship intentionally mm -hmm. by first knowing what kind of a relationship would you like to have? Because that's not sexy. That's not romantic. I guess, it, I guess it's not, but he wasn't even talking specifically about sex. Uh -huh. And I think I would encourage people who are really interested in this subject to be talking about it on a date in a public place mm. where you're obviously not trying to lead the other person into your bedroom. Yeah. You're just getting to know them, but we get really weird sometimes, or at least some of us do. Uh, and again, I think it's just such a normal question to ask, you know, what, if I'm, if the two of us are talking about relationships and relationships that failed and what we'd like to see happen in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, how it's just natural. So how, how did you used to get along the two of you uh, in the bedroom? How, how was that part of your relationship? Good. And, and there's nothing vulgar about that question. And people could say, well, it was great or no, it was terrible. And, and you get to say, so what was great about it or what was terrible about it? And and to be prepared to answer that question when the other person turns the tables on you and asks you about your past. But, you know, some of us have had um, great relationships, sexually speaking, 
and terrible other aspects of the relationship. And for other people, it's just the exact opposite. But I think we all want to be, I remember one woman, she asked me on a date after we I had brought up a s- subject. Actually, she brought it up and I answered her question and she Ooh, sex sure is important to you, isn't it? It's very shaming. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Isn't it important to you? And she looked down at her plate of spaghetti and um, we were going Italian and she thought about it. And then, then after like 30 seconds of hard thinking, she said in this little girl squeaky voice, you know, indicating she was really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. She, she said, yes. <laughs> so I well of course it's important. I mean it, how could it not be important if the the rules of society including religion and in some countries even the law says you can't be having sex outside of marriage. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, why would you not want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, because marriage because sex isn't everything, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just because sex isn't everything doesn't mean it's not something and something important. So, yeah. Do you feel this is people's general discomfort in talking about sex as a subject? Do you feel like that's part of the reason why maybe some people don't bring this up? I mean, I th- I have to believe that and I think we get uncomfortable or we learn our discomfort long before we date that individual who brings up the subject. And and we find ourselves feeling uncomfortable. It's it's a lack of desensitization to this adult part of life. We associate innocence with childhood, and 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 sexuality with something darker. But I think that's because of normal human development. We don't hit puberty until eleven, twelve, thirteen, and we're not particularly interested in uh, sex in the in the scheme of doing it. Um, as you know, as we get at upon puberty, mm-hmm. and so it feels a little suspicious. Like, should I? Can I talk about this? Is this okay? And most of us don't have comfortable sex education conversations about this. I mean, it would be awesome if sex education included a comment about how natural it would be that you'll be having feelings you haven't had before, and and some of those feelings will involve you know, being touched in ways that give you pleasures you've never had. Now, that's not particularly vulgar. uh, And I think there's a way to talk about it at greater length. But instead, most sex ed isn't really human sex education. It's more veterinarian sex education. Like this is, uh, these are the body parts and this is how they function. And this is how diseases get spread. And this is how the female gets pregnant. And I think I think that's singularly unhelpful to look at human sex education in that way because it's so divorced from any human context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree because I lived it. And <laughs> I mean, unless I completely wasn't paying attention to my class, but I graduated with honors, <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> Top 10%, I think, in my high school. And I took some blow-off classes. So I remember I got in, I just made it in that, but I still... It's like the top 10% graduated class doesn't know how to have these conversations. So it's right. like, how top are they? And right, right. So. Especially in this very important area, because it mm-hmm. is important for marriage and for all relationships that we have as adults that are of a romantic nature. Even if we never have sex with our partner, just to be able to deal intelligently with sexuality, because it, it's such a vital part of our love lives. And. Yeah. And, and talking a little bit more on this, you say sometimes people can do it, but they can't talk about it. Um, and is that also just a... It's pretty much the American way, isn't it? We're, we're, willing, to, to, yeah. we're willing to do it with just about anybody, <laughs> uh-huh. but we, we're not willing to talk about it with anybody either. <laughs> so, and is that part of the... Obviously, probably part of the health... Um, like the sexual reproductive, whatever classes that we have, the health classes. And is it just like you said before, I think it's like some sort of societal uncomfort, discomfort with sex. Yeah. Even my young clients who I know you're, you're like really old now, Mm -hmm. uh, older than you'd ever dreamed of being. Yeah. And um, (laughs) the, my young clients who are in their teens and twenties, they tell me sex education is still the same yeah. as it, as 
as my children experienced years ago, and I think as you experienced it. So nobody's learning how to have these safe, comfort, comfortable conversations. I've had parents uh, confront me with, well, my children know they can talk to me about anything they want. They can ask me anything they want. And my response is, really? Do they? Do they? Because um, you're saying that something you've never brought up, you've never discussed it in any way with your children, and it's very uncomfortable across our, our society. But of course, they'll feel perfectly comfortable asking the parent who's never talked about these things. And, you know, this this splinter idea of magic sex number, it's just such a small part of fi figuring out if we're sexually compatible. You know, you and I have talked about um, open marriages or people who are uh, strictly um, monogamous and are, are polyamorous or all the other varieties of sexual experiences and lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And you would think, again, people would want to know this before they get into a relationship. Yeah. And I realize some people get together when they're so young they don't really know themselves and they might think, oh yeah, I'm heterosexual. And then it's only after years of trying to live in a heterosexual relationship that, that, that they are not. Hmm. And I've talked to both men and women who've had that experience and said, wow, that was, those were dark years. I never want to go back to that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just don't think we need to be too judgmental about this. And the only reason I bring up magic sex number at all to people is in a, with the idea of, first of all, in marriage counseling to help bring, highlight the lack of sustainability in the relationship. And for people who are not yet uh, in a committed relationship to take a look at it because they could save themselves a lot of pain. Yeah. Trying to make it work with somebody who's fundamentally sexually incompatible. And do you have marriages or people who do have this problem when they are married and have have they found a compromise even though we talked about compromises don't really work or do they end up splitting or is there any sort of well they don't always that? end up splitting up i mean sometimes they may stay together but you know and and, and that brings up an idea that i i wish people could be more open about divorce because i think every problem has a solution and if the problem if one can be open minded to imagine a problem like oops, I think I made a big mistake in who I picked out to marry. Um, once you get there, it's like, well, what is the remedy? For so many people, the remedy, sadly, is, well, they're going to have a, a, a lifestyle of furtive uh, masturbation where they sneak and are masturbating, trying to keep up with their sexual needs. Mm -hmm. um, and like like the person who's sneaking naps, with the, the the partner who only sleeps three hours a, a night and turns it into a moral issue, and the other person is going to work and sleeping at, during their lunch hours, sleeping another hour after work, saying they're working overtime, lying and <laughs> sneaking and all that rest, and it would be silly. Nobody does that, but when it comes to sex, yeah, that's that's one reason why people are so often vulnerable to affairs. People are vulnerable to going to prostitutes, even in areas where prostitution is illegal. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, it's, and I think people also, pe angry people who are chronically dissatisfied tend to be pretty grumpy people. Yeah. And they're, they're really hard to be around. And they, they end up behaving badly at some point in some way, no matter how good they are at coping. So, you know, I think it was Freud who came up with the idea of sublimating where I do one thing because I'm not getting what some other need in my life met. So if my, my need for sexual um, intimacy isn't met, well, then I'm just going to go buy more toys, yeah, you know, or buy more jewelry or buy more, right. whatever it is that makes me feel better for a short period of time mm -hmm. because I need that hit of uh, serotonin, dopamine. And I don't, I just don't, I don't think we're supposed to live that way. So Yeah. It's a really common problem. Yeah. Do you have people who give you pushback with it at all? Like, or, or challenge your, your ideas of this? Or? Sure. Well, you know, typically the person who doesn't want sex in the, in the course of couples counseling will say he doesn't need, or she doesn't need sex that much mm. all right. as if any of us could tell the other person what they need. 
Yeah. And, and that's just not true. I mean, people get very morally shamed over their sexual number, you know, their idealized sexual number, but it simply is what it is. And, and we don't need to make it into a moral issue. It's more like um, the beginning of the crack in the facade of denial, you know, that's mm-hmm. where people say, really, you really need it that often to feel comfortable. And they're, they're, somewhat stupefied or mystified. And then sometimes happily, um, people are very compatible, but they were, they weren't talking about it. And so they weren't having sex because they couldn't talk about it in a coherent manner. So for somebody to say, well, I'd like to have sex more often. And the other partner says, you would. And well, why don't you ever say that? I always thought you didn't. Well, I just did, was mad because we weren't getting along and I wasn't in the mood at that moment. Or mm-hmm. it's just we've had so much stress in our life or whatever it is that is keeping them apart sexually. And unlike most marriage counselors, I tend to think that the marriage I'm dealing with is a construct merely of the relationship the two humans have and that my clients consist of the, of simply the two humans. So I think one of the remedies for a flawed selection in holy matrimony would be, oh, well, I just, I need to, you know, get the etch-a-sketch and turn it upside down and shake it out because we could just get a divorce. Yeah. So much harder when, once the children come along, right? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to be so much harder. It could be uh, respectful and mutually caring. It could be, you know, the, one of those more enlightened sort of breakups uh, where that's based on love. Well, I love you, so I don't want you to be miserable. And if I am really not the right match for you in that er- very important area, then of course I want you to be free to move on. Yeah, I think they call it like a conscious uncoupling. Yeah, con- conscious or is it conscious or conscientious? Like, I, I think of Gwyneth Paltrow all the time oh. and, her, and her goop company and the billions she's making. But I, <laughs> whatever it is, I think being able to do that without the recriminations, the yelling, the screaming, uh, and the domestic violence, the police getting called and all the rest of it, we don't have to keep making the lawyers rich. We could just, you know, do something rational and easygoing. Um, but that tells you, you know, about, I think, some of the obstacles people have to being rational. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's why, again, like with that too, that's why I think we really put a heavy focus on, I mean, managing love intelligently. A lot of it starts before going into that relationship. I mean, there's stuff within the relationship that you do, but if you could build a solid foundation with somebody, then you're in a much better situation obviously than if you don't and it's about talking about and having these kind of conversations and figuring these sort of things out absolutely so i'm going to tell you something that i know other lesser beings than yourself Mm -hmm. would be tempted to use against me (laughs) but um (laughs) you know when in when i show that if you ever want to make me crazy um you specifically yeah yeah it would be to minimize these sorts of uh, issues that really matter to couples. Well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. And besides, you know, they can, they can work it out. They can compromise after we've talked about it at length. And so for some couples, you know, there, there are these universal deal breakers. I don't even know if we've talked about that already, but you know, universal deal breakers to me would be deal breakers that would sabotage any relationship and make it into the unloving alternative. And that would be, Things like drug abuse, un, 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 unwillingness to treat a ongoing mental health issue. Um, oh, and and abuse, physical and emotional abuse. That would those would all definitely unwind any relationship. But then there are those personal deal breakers, and I think the magic sex number is one of those, mm. where it's a little bit like you know being a one of us is a neat freak and the other one is really very casual when it comes to housekeeping. And so the person who's a nine on a scale of one to 10 gets together with somebody who's a two and 
they get to look forward to a lifelong commitment to picking up after the other person. And for most of us, once we really think about it, that would be really unsustainable. And there are a lot of issues like that, you know, and and I think affection is another one, like um, not sex, not intercourse itself, but uh, affection between a man and woman uh, where he needs uh, just to feel comfortable, to feel himself and to be able to express himself for who he is. He needs X number of hugs. X number of kisses, X number of verbal expressions of I love you. Um, and and her numbers really ideally will be somewhat close to his own. Because if they're too far apart, again, it's like needlessly alienating. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be that way. The other person might be a perfectly wonderful person. They're just not wonderful for you. What about the people who are like, well, I could change for them? Is that like yes. a, is that like a I dated her. Oh, <laughs> but is that like you're betraying yourself or is that like a self betrayal or what exactly does that do? Like, well, I'll, I'll let the listeners decide because I remember dating one woman where I said, Hey, you know, I explained what the magic sex number is. And I said, why don't, and she said, well, I don't know. I said, tell you what, and we were at a restaurant. I said, Wait, let's turn this, these paper napkins over. We'll just write on one side, a number of idealized number of times we'd like to have sex per week per week right. and she and and then we'll both turn our our napkins over at the same time she said well okay <laughs> and and we turned our our napkins over at the same time and they were like the numbers were very different and then you're like check please <laughs> yeah well <laughs> it doesn't mean that she's I not a that. wonderful person or wonderful for me to get to know it just means Hey, you know, maybe not wonderful for each other. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not really a match. Mm-hmm. And but you have the foresight to do that. And the people going back to the love conversation, if people are in love, they would maybe neglect that and follow the love and be like, well, I love this person. Well, yeah, I want to get laid tonight. Yeah. So the strategy I'm employing is to make sure she thinks I don't care about sex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because then she's more likely to offer sex. But if I'm very eager and I really want to have sex, maybe she's less likely. And so we all try, it seems like we're all tempted at some stage of our life at least, to try to manipulate the other person, to control their thinking about us. She doesn't want him thinking she's a slut. He doesn't want her thinking he's a horn dog. And so they each kind of play it out instead of just having a conversation yeah. and, and being who you are. Yeah. And and the man who, you know, judges her or the woman who judges him can uh we can just say, well, it's been really great getting to know you a little bit. I gotta go now. And <laughs> because they're not really for us. For the for the stronger person though, I would say even when you get judged, if if you can keep your wits about you, it's a wonderful opportunity for a great conversation, somewhat like the conversation I think a cat has with a mouse when it's paws on the mouse's tail, Mm -hmm. you get to have a conversation (laughs) and bat things around a little bit uh, while you're, because you've already let go of this relationship. Mm -hmm. So to be able to go follow up and say, so you think there's a right number? What is the right number of times a man should want to have sex? 5.5. 5.5. Uh, yeah. Or, uh, well, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. I don't know. Why do you always want to talk about weird things? You know, and it, it's, well, so you don't think sex is that important. Not as important as you do. You know, there's just a lot. It's hard to get past some shaming behaviors. But if you're, if you've taken your inoculations, you've had all your shots, you, you'll be pretty much immune to the shame and you can just enjoy the show. Just relax and enjoy all the attempts to belittle you and <laughs> mock you because you're not taking it into your heart. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very important that for all of us to be, you know, if we're going to be intelligently managing our, our love, we need to be able to be comfortable with who we are and to know where we're coming from. And when someone is downloading a bunch of nonsense, well, it's such an, a wonderful occasion for a very interesting conversation. Tell me, where did you get these ideas? How long have you been thinking this way? Has this ever affected any of your other relationships? Have you ever had a good relationship where everything worked out this way? Too many questions. Next. No. <laughs> I want to know. I think it'd be so fascinating to talk to them because 
they're still interesting if yeah. you can get past, you know, the, the taking it personally. Definitely. So what happened then with the woman that you were with? So then you flip over the napkins. Which one? I, the one, <laughs> the so, one with the napkins. You flip them over and both numbers are off. She did. You know, the reason I brought that story up was because she did say, she looked at my, my number and she said, well, I could do that. Oh, okay. And that's not what any of us really want to hear. Hmm. So I'm glad you brought me back to this. So if that happens and, and somebody else's thing. Yeah, it's works. wishful thinking. But a guy could think if we didn't mention this, I think it's like, oh, I want to do seven times a week. And she's like, and she was a three and she's like, okay, I could do that. Or so, vice versa. Or vice versa. He looks at her three and he says, you know what? I do think I could do that. All right. You know, and it's, they may be, I, I, I personally don't think they are fooling anybody but themselves because I think really and truly we want what we want. It's like saying, well, I could do with a thousand calories. I mean, if you're only eating a thousand calories, I guess I, I could deal, I could deal with that. Mm -hmm. Or you only sleep three hours a night. I could deal with that. Yeah. Um, but that's not really how sleep works. We, we all tend to sleep our own peculiar number of required hours and eat our own peculiar number of required calories. But when it comes to sex, it's a team event. And so we've got to sort of be on the same page, not identicality again. I don't think we have to be identical in our, our desires, but to just be able to be close enough to make it work. Um, so what did you tell her then? I said, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think that would work for me. She said, why not? And I, I said, well, because I really would like to be somebody who wants what I want, mm -hmm. not who'd be willing to put up with me. Because if you're willing to put up with me, I think that's a time limited offer. Mm. And at some point, uh, the the best buy date is going to go by, and you're going to be looking for a refund. Mm. So it's not really going to work um, any more than a person who's a two on on neatness getting together with somebody who's an eight or a nine. Well, I could, I think I could keep my house that clean. Yeah. yeah, but do you, would you really want to? I mean, and what you say though, cleanliness is not next to godliness. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not the same thing. It's okay to be a two. Did, what did she say then to that response? She, I th she, she seemed did she to get it. Yeah, she seemed to mm. like. She seemed to get it, and and I think it was frankly honoring of her, um, for her to be able to think it was okay to want sex as infrequently as she wanted. And I say infrequently only by comparison to myself. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there was anything wrong with her number. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think I've heard a number that I think there's anything wrong with, you know, the, the sea of humanity all falls in this regard on a bell shaped curve. And I assume the listener knows what a bell shaped curve is. And it pretty much explains just about every difference between one human and another in terms of height and weight and IQ income and just all so many other things, but certainly sexual appetites. There are people who are at their best when they're having sex. I've talked to couples where each one of them preferred to have sex four times a day. And, and that was not me. <laughs> <laughs> and I've also talked to couples who were very happy with a once a week or once every two weeks kind of regimen. Yeah. And, but to be somewhat close, because what I found is that even over time, um, age doesn't really seem to be too much of a variable that affects this kind of desire. Mm. So as long as our health holds out, we're usually able to maintain. Um, then there's that other phenomenon. Well, we were having sex every day when we first got together. But after the first year, well, we never had sex that frequently again, ever. Mm -hmm. And there, there are games people play with, you know, putting marbles in jars to count the number of yeah. times they've had sex, that kind of thing. And um, it's, I think that particular statistic is skewed by confusing sexual frequency with intimacy mm -hmm. because i think people can have a sex life initially that is highly based on titillation and where it's all new 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 
and they're having sex in every room of the house, in every position. They've gone through the front yard, the backyard. They've had sex in the car, both front and back seat. And it's like, yawn. Okay, pretty much done it all. Yeah. And once you have, if you're if you're a person who's titillation oriented only, we're all titillation oriented, but some happy uh, minority, I think, of us are really very keyed into the need for a meaningful connection and feeling safe and sharing who we are with one another, a phenomenon I would call intimacy. If you have intimacy, it really isn't based on whether or not it's the same because it's never the same. Mm-hmm. It's always different because you're both changing every day and you're both growing and evolving. And so ideas that you never used to have when you were 20, perhaps involving a parachute and midgets, um, you, you may have those ideas at 40 because you know, you're decadent and you've yeah. been around and traveled the, the world and seen a lot of parachutes. More sophisticated at that age. Yes. <laughs> Um, one other thing I want to bring up. So what about, so I've heard some people when I bring this up say about like pregnancy and, and the number changing for women after that. And I don't want to say that's like speak on behalf of women, but I've some women I talk to a lot of them, they will say their sex life declined after pregnancy. And then I mentioned to them, I was like, well, the therapist I work with would say there's maybe something else there or it's, you didn't have a truly intimate relationship because I don't know. So have you heard that before? With sure. People? And I've heard it both ways, by the way, mm. that women who go through the hormonal changes, hormonal mm-hmm. changes relate, related to pregnancy, sometimes come out of the experience wanting sex more often or enjoying sex uh, a great deal during pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and many men who are uncomfortable, they don't like that idea. It was okay when we were boyfriend, girlfriend, but gosh, now you're my wife. And it's that Madonna whore thing that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. So, um, cause she really looks like the Madonna now she's ready to give birth to the Christ child. So we, we probably shouldn't be having sex. That would be wrong. <laughs> yeah. And we have an episode on that. It's the Madonna whore complex. If you want to d- dive more into that. So when we talk about this, you know, it's for me, yeah, I I look forward to having sex with my wife, but if my wife approached me on a day or at a time I didn't want to have sex, I would be happy to have sex with her because for me, it's part of being in a loving relationship and caring for her. And she, for the most part, I think would be exactly the same way. And we have little games we play where she might roll her eyes and say, are you kidding me? You know, I, you know, I don't have that much time or, you know, <laughs> um, whatever. And, but really it's, I would say our relationship is characterized more often than not by a profound commitment to taking care of one another. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if my wife were in any discomfort sexually or in any other way, I would want to help her with that. And I would be delighted to have sex with her, even if I myself wasn't interested in sex, even if I myself wasn't capable of having uh, uh, normal genital to genital sex, I would be more than happy to take care of her in some other way. Yeah. But what about going back to the pregnancy thing? Is that something that happens, like especially with hormonal changes? Absolutely. So people can be like, hey, we have the magic sex number. We did the thing, but then we had the kid and now she's changed. Well, that's kind of what I, I, maybe my answer was just a little too oblique. Um, What I'm saying is even if my sex number changed because of some health consideration, Mm -hmm. I would still want to have that kind of closeness and intimacy with my partner at about the same rate. So it almost goes, because you're, but that's because you're in a loving relationship with intimacy and that you want to take care of one another. Right. That's that's what you're saying. Right. And so even if my own inner uh, sexual compass was readjusted and I had a a new version of true north in my head, I would still be wanting to have that, that special closeness that comes from sharing those kinds of moments together. And I think, I think what I wouldn't want to do is advise a woman, oh yeah, if you're really disliking sex, 
to keep having sex with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a great way to kill love, right? Yeah. Um, but then to take a look at that and and take a look at, well, talking to a doctor, seeing what's going on with your health, and perhaps even taking a look at the woman's own buying into the Madonna whore complex. Mm. Maybe she too has an issue with that. All right. Uh, or maybe there's been some other programming in her early childhood that had her going down that road. Whatever it is, I mean, it could be a simple relationship problem where she used to really like him and respect him, and now she's lost all respect for him following some sort of event where he looked particularly bad or he's become an alcoholic, yeah. you know, and things have changed. So it, it may be hormonal, but the hormonal uh, timing may be only coincidental with other issues. Other. So it's complicated, right? Mm -hmm. But not so complicated humans can't understand it. Yeah. So it's just about rather than just leaping to that conclusion, it probably would be good to analyze what else is going on in your relationship to see if there is anything else that could be causing it. Because a lot of times when I, the women that I've talked to who've had this issue and you get more deep into it, there's other issues that happened, you know, like once the kid was born, he wasn't helping out or he was going away yes. or this or that. And then that then led to the disres or she lost respect for him. Like more yeah, and more. And or, more and yeah. Then, I was thinking about the middle-aged guys who get into their sports and it's all about watching sports on TV and drinking a beer and then expecting hot sex before he goes to sleep. That's the American dream. All right. That's, <laughs> that's the episode. <laughs> Mic drop there. So no, it's, I think, um, you know, for it's, it's absurd to think some woman is going to be looking forward to be using as a, to being used as a, a sperm receptacle for what is essentially masturbation on his part. Hmm. You know, it's really about coming together in an intimate and enjoyable way. Yeah. And if, it, if that isn't happening, well then we both need to be talking about that. The person, the, the saying in therapy is the person with the pain is the person with the problem. And if I feel like I'm simply being used uh, for some sort of a sexual stand in, then I need to speak up and say, hey, what we just did, that's not working for me. And you probably don't want to have that conversation late at night when you're both exhausted. But, you know, certainly when you're rested the next weekend and you have some time to talk about things, hey, I want to talk to you about this because this is not working for me. And then figuring out what is missing, what is going on, because uh, it works both ways there where men use women for sex in a marriage after years of being uh, systematically desensitized to all the titillating elements and they're just going through the motions kind of, but sometimes it's the woman who's phoning it, to, phoning it in mm. and going through the motions and she's, she's not really present in the sexual experience. In fact, that's, that's what makes it so much like masturbation is really sometimes nobody's present. It just mm. feels very, very weird and very alienating. Yeah. Instead of bringing people together. Yeah. And they should be having sex to come together. Well, they, they should be. Yeah. It's a celebration of coming together. And I think that it's, it's something that, you know, I was talking to a couple who, where he got in some trouble with the law and because of her parents' disapproval, um, she stepped away from sex, but, and had to move out of the house, but he ended up they end up having sex. They only have sex once, one third as often as they normally do. Mm. And when asked about that, um, he was hurt by it. And she, because she wanted to be in the relationship and she loved him, but she felt as though her parents would judge her for spending too much time with him. Mm. So she was taking advantage of these very narrow windows of opportunity to have sex, almost like a teenager sneaking so, sex, yeah. you know, under the parent's eye. Mm. So then to wrap up for this, what would you say about um, one last thing I wanted to get into with magic sex number? Um, people lying. Is that something that is <laughs> common? And then how, well, what, just a quick thing. And how would you advise people to do that? Like I have an idea of maybe, I don't, I don't know. Like what, what's your idea? About so it? if you're, if you mean by lying where he's deliberately lowballing his number because he wants to meet her where he thinks she is, 
or she's deliberately elevating her number because she's heard about his sex life from other girlfriends of hers. Yeah, either or just Yeah, either way. Lying is a uh, uh lying I think is it is just part of being a human being. I mean, even I think all of the great apes lie. I think even monkeys lie, you know, those little apes with tails. I think mm-hmm. lying is part of what it means to to be in our species and it's inescapable. We want what we want and people are at different levels of spiritual maturity and evolution. So, so you, I think, what is it that Ronald Reagan used to say something about trust, but verify. Mm. So she says she likes to have sex this number of times. We don't have to be in a sexual relationship for me to take that number into my head. But then uh, for me, and I think, I would highly recommend to most couples, even religious couples uh, whose pastors would probably say something different. I think if you're looking at getting married and you have any doubt whatsoever in your mind that the other person has been less than really truthful, Mm -hmm. I think really being in a sexually active relationship is pretty important in, in terms of checking things out. And it isn't just the number of times we're having sex because she may or he may submit to the other person's ideal number and be faking it. It's are they happy? Are they enthusiastic? And I think most of us can tell when other people are lying. You know, Abraham Lincoln's idea that you can fool some of the people some of the time and uh, or some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time. I think that that's true. It, you just can't fool all the people all the time. Mm. And for us to, you know, whatever the number is, you take it for checking and and see how it feels. Um, and, and part of that is certainly checking out the physical affection, like the hugging and the kissing mm. and all of that. So being more like aware of what exactly actions are being done. Yeah. And and discerning whether the other person is actually comfortable Yeah, and talking about it over and over again, and also taking a history and asking about their past relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really just crazy for people to take the, the, take the word of a person they hardly know. (laughs) And that they, and I know people who get married all the time, with less than a month of knowing each other, less yeah. than three months of knowing each other. Mm-hmm. I think it's absurd to think, oh, well, all all of the opposite sex, they're equally uh, self-informed, they, they're really self-aware, and and they're all equally honest. Well, that's that's naive. Yeah. So we all owe it to ourselves to do a, a true intentional interview and get to the bottom of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do the interview and then observe, be aware, like, don't just be like, well, I asked the questions. It's all good to go. Like you have to be conscious with what's going on within the relationship or conscientious, whichever. Right. Um, and then from there, assess it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Cool. So to wrap things up, we have a listener question. And again, if you have a question for Steve, visit steveningcom and fill out the contact form. And this, this week's question is as follows. I listened to your podcast about the epidemic of lonely men, and you are describing my 21-year-old son. He finished high school during the pandemic, so the few friends he did have evaporated. He has not made a move towards going to college or school for any trade, and he's not working either. He's in his room playing video games all night and sleeping past noon every day. I would love for him to listen to that episode, but when I tried to talk to him about it, he rolled his eyes and shut his bedroom door. I can tell he's lost and depressed and he has refused my offer of counseling, even career counseling. Everything you talked about in the Lonely Men episode was a wake-up call. I'm a single mom and I have no idea how to help him. Well, my heart goes out to both of them, the mom and the son. Um, But I'm especially hurt that he didn't want to listen to my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Look, there's only so much control any of us have over another human being and Part of, for me, that was a lesson I learned in Al-Anon. It was just so important, you know, that I can't really control another person, not their choices, not their thoughts, not their beliefs. And, but but what I can control is whether or not I'm going to be a codependent. Hmm. And I know as a parent, I would never want to put my kid on the street. Um, I don't want my kids to ever be homeless. However, 
I can't just be endlessly writing checks for someone who's sleeping uh, all hours of the day and only engaged in video games and is never working and is, is really stuck in their development. So what to do, what to do? Well, I mean, to serve notice that this is un unacceptable. Here's the offer for a job. I got you a job. You can take it or not. Or And, and I would recommend to all parents right now, if you can't think of any options, there are really two big ones. One is you can tell your child you must join the military. Yeah, I was going to say army. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You must join the military. The army would be a good choice. And or you must join a uh, trade union and go through an apprenticeship program and become a, a plumber or a car carpenter or an electrician or something. So those are those are not jobs where I'm going to get interviewed and dismissed. Um, they're almost always going to take any of us because there's a shortage in those two areas. Those are honorable and in many cases, high paying uh, jobs certainly will help a young person grow up and mature. And the alternative would be, and I'm going to give you three months to get that together. And after three months, you must leave. Mm. I'm going to be renting out your room. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's where I have to deal with my codependency. And I think this mom, honestly, uh, you know, I, for mothers, I, I do have a generalized sort of observation that fathers know that in, the, in this life, pain is inevitable and that it must be overcome in order for anyone to be successful. Moms tend to think, but this is my baby. I'll do anything to prevent my baby from feeling pain. And so uh, for a mom who's on her own, she has to be mom and dad. And what worked when he was one, two, or three years old is not working now that he's 21. So that's it. She has to give him that ultimatum and then he has to make the choice. And it's a tough decision for all of them, like you said. Really, it uh, is. And but we're talking America in the 21st century and the, the military, not just the army, but all of the branches of the military have so many options mm -hmm. and we're not sending somebody off to certain death. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have a chance to, you know, get out from under mom's roof and learn the ways of the world and do some growing up. And what a gift, what a gift. And very few boys are going to grow up into men who've gone through that and are going to hate their mom for the rest of their life. Yeah. So don't worry, mom. It'll, it'll all work out. Cool. Well, great. And he gets to play the video game of, of life. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> and get to a higher level. Yeah. <laughs> great. All right. Well, thanks for the question. And thanks, Steve. It's good chatting with you as always. Same here. Mm -hmm.